This is the Drummers Only Podcast, brought to you by the UK's leading drum store. Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, Drummers Only Podcast number 64. Uh, with the wonderful Jonathan Atkinson. How are you, Jonathan? Good evening. I'm I'm very well. Nice to see you. You too. You too, man. Um, I've been doing some research for you out there that perhaps haven't come to to meet John's playing yet. And his credits. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna run through some of his credits because they're bonkers. Um, his recording credits include Sir George Martin. Yes, that Sir George Martin. Uh, Grammy nominated producer Chris Sheldon. The Doctor Who. Art, uh, album concerts and TV, TV series Howard Jones uh, Kim Wilde which is your current gig Kim Wilde yes um, well it's a current gig I, I've been doing it it'll be 20 years that I've been doing it next year really wow okay yeah, yeah. okay I didn't realise it was that long um, yeah, I, 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 wow so there you go um, a Japanese megastar Kayla Kimura who had Japanese number one Japanese album in February 07 uh, Sir Willard White which was in the top 20 classical album. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber, uh, music for the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, music for the Millennium Dome, music for Millennium Remembrance Day, Velvet Jones, to Toya, to Pow, Swing Out Sister, and that's just your recording credits. Soundtracks go from Paddington 2, Johnny English Strikes Again, the Lance Armstrong biopic that Stephen Frears did, Disney's 101 Dalmatian Street, um, various uh, uh, game soundtracks, Lineage Eternal Game Soundtrack, uh, Doctor Who again, Britain's Got Talent. Um, you've worked with Lorne Balfe, who is huge in the com- the, comp- the composition game. Uh, tour credits from Paul Young, Kim Wilde, Howard Jones, Rick Astley, Jamelia, Boy George, Majure, Belinda Carlisle, on and on and on. Plus, we get to West End shows. You wrote and programmed the drum part for Bombay Dreams. Yeah, uh, that's... Uh... That was a while back. <laughs> yeah, and you've played on just about every show going. <clears throat> I, I, I've done quite a few shows, yeah, I have. Wow, so that's quite a career so far. It, well, yeah, let, I mean, let's hope, let's hope I'm not uh, getting too close to the end of it, because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm loving it. <laughs> I don't think so, somehow. Well, no, it's, it's good. I've, um, I've been very fortunate, and um, I, it's something that I really enjoy doing, playing the drums, and... Mm. Um, you know, long may it continue. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. So the, the thing that struck me more than anything, I guess, over l- reading your credits and all that is just um, a versatility um, that's perhaps missing these days. Yeah, I I think that's probably one of the most important skills to have, I think, to probably, to, to, I mean, inevitably, if, you, if you're going to call yourself a bit of an all-rounder, Mm. stroke jack of all trades but i mean put, you know if you're going to call yourself a, a, an all-rounder you you've got to be able to cover a lot a lot of ground musically and that and that means sort of stylistically as well as you know whether it's the technology or or um which has certainly been you know being being comfortable with using electronics as, as, as something that's been um something that's got me got me a lot of gigs you know mm. to mm-hmm. to be able to sort of um I guess problem solve um, a, a specific requirement for a specific situation mm-hmm. is is it going to be possible to do this? Yes, absolutely. You know, can, can make that work. And um, you know, I, I think I think having a, having a breadth of understanding of, of lots of different parts of what it means to be a you know just a drummer um, yeah. is 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 useful. You know, and and I hope that I bring to whatever whatever situation it is that i'm doing a, a sort of a, a wide understanding of not just not just the drums but the, the music surrounding it as well mm. it seems that you were pretty switched on to that idea quite early like did you come up knowing that kind of having a, a string to many bows was important um i don't i don't know i think it just it it, it interests me to, <laughs> to um <laughs> And maybe maybe it's also slightly the control freak side of me that that is interested in in all in all parts of of, of the sort of the the production of of music as a, as a whole. Whether that's in a live situation, I would want to be having, you know, 
conversations with the front of house engineer about drum sound and how do we get that mm. you know what mics we're going to use and we wanted to have conversations with you know the artists about how do we want to run the tracks you know how much space do you want to talk between songs all those sort of things that right. um you know just to have a really broad um input into what i'm doing but also a broad understanding of of of, of my place in in you know in 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 the music creation process um whatever it is whether whether it's doing a hollywood film score or whether it's mm. playing a you know playing a a, a little gig somewhere you know and any, anything you know anything in between those two sort of opposite ends of the spectrum um just to sort of I, but yeah no in, in answer to your question yes i think I, I i think i knew sort of fairly early on that that i wanted to be a, a rounded musician i mean i started playing piano when i was quite young right. i played trumpet trumpet for a bit and i did a bit of orchestral percussion which I was not particularly good at but i'm glad <laughs> that i did it um before i, I didn't start playing the drums till i was 14 uh, but i'd already you know done sort of tours as a trumpet player you know orchestral you know counter youth orchestra stuff and, yeah, and, and yeah, those yeah. sort of things you know and it just it just it all helps it all helps yeah it does and, but there's so many other things you talked about before you even get to musicality like are, are above and beyond what most people will take on now so I, even that that ability to have a conversation with the front of house engineer is becoming more and more diminished yeah i think it's really important though you know, uh, oh, I, I agree I, with you. I, you know, uh, because, because uh, you, you hear you hear so many people sort of talking about about the drum sound that they're after. You know, this is my sound or whatever, and they they they're going for one thing. And the front house engineer is desperately trying to trying to rein in, you know, to to make it work in a arena. Mm -hmm. The fact that your your bass drum is just <laughs> you know booming too long, and actually, what's yeah. needed is is something short and punchy with all the energy sort of happening right at the beginning of the sound, and not lasting for two seconds so having those uh, you know I, I would always try and um have those sort of conversations as part of a part of a team you know i mean yeah. of it not it's not always appropriate there are, there are there yeah. are times when uh, when when it's not appropriate to, to get stuck in but i think it's useful you know if you're on a if you're on a under pressure um session or whatever uh, like a like a TV thing where time is of the essence, and you can usefully, from from experience, come up with a solution to a problem, then that's a helpful thing. Not always. Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, if, if if there's sixty sixty piece orchestra sitting in the room, and you're gonna you're not gonna stick your hand up and, and say anything. You just got to keep your head down and yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> just do your thing. Yeah, it was funny because I was thinking about talking about this with you yesterday because I was talking to a customer and I've been doing the odd theatre show of late I'm dramming and things and someone asks me how do you get into it and then you, you sort of list all the ways in which anybody gets into it but it, it, it obviously starts with facility and ability to to do things like read um, but this young guy was talking about wanting to do sort of more modern things and he's kind of torn between do you learn to read or do you learn production and electronics and all that? You know, because nowadays I think having a skill set like reading is not seen as as valuable as being able to work Ableton. Yeah, I mean, I do, I do see that, and I think, I think being being comfortable with Ableton is a useful skill, but I think reading Trump does. If you were to make a choice, I think, I think it trumps that. But it right. depends what you want to do, doesn't it? I mean, you know, if you if you choose. I'm going to be careful not to get on any sort of high horse here, but um, <laughs> no, high horse, away, man. <laughs> um, well, no, I, I I do see that that uh, there are some people that feel that they want to um, approach drums in a certain way, and that might involve not educating themselves in certain stuff mm -hmm. and educating themselves in other stuff, and that's fine. <laughs> but if you do that, you're shutting yourself off from a load of information that um, that can come to you written and you're also shutting yourself off from a load of work that is only going to happen if you can read and that just seems a little bit crazy to me i mean i i would always want to be in a position where i feel like i have all the skills that you could possibly have covered to a degree so that you don't get caught out because i mean I, you know i have to be fair i have been in situations where <laughs> um people have come unstuck because their reading's not good enough and that's uh, you know 
you, you've got to be able to play. Of course, you've got to, you've got to be able to play, and you've got to, you you know, and your skill set is going to be whatever your skill set is. But if you can add to that, then great. You know, I think I think that's a really useful thing. And be, and having every part of the production process, you know, an understanding of it, if not if not a mastery of it, but at least an understanding of what all these parts mean can only be helpful and it means that you have a greater respect and understanding for the people that you're working with you know even even if you know i'm never going to be a lighting engineer not ever am i going to be a lighting engineer but <laughs> i've worked with some really good ones and i'm aware that there are issues that they have that if i can take that into account makes their job a little bit easier and then it's a happier team on the road and you know a happy team makes everybody work better and you know yeah it's sort of a, sort of as simple as that really and just just having a having an understanding and respect for everybody's everybody's job is a, is a, is a useful thing well you know whether whether you're on on the road or in the studio yeah I, I mean you can see that i think just looking at your credits you can see that your gigs have been high-end reading gigs and high-end production gigs you don't get howard jones's gig if you don't know how to work electronic drums or electronic instruments yeah but you don't that, get... was, that was next level that gig yeah <laughs> um, i did that I, I did that show for tw about 12 years and when yeah. i started um when i started it was playing an acoustic kit actually and um and he was he was just in the in the um because I think he, I think Howard has really tried to sort of reinvent himself through different sort of times of his, his career, and I understand why. You know, he's had, had a very long career, and he was just going through a phase of wanting everything to be really acoustic. Yeah. Uh, and we had like we did gigs with brass sections, we did gigs with like loads of BVs, we did gigs with the choir, we wow. had string sections. I mean, we all these sort of different different things. And then the sort of the big change came. I, I guess it would have been. Like, 2011 something that's that sort of time when he decided that he wanted to um recreate his first two albums um and and put on a show that was all the songs on the first two albums like the first half and the second half right this is you know this is my first album this is my second album and here's all the songs including all the album tracks that you know a bit <laughs> and, and you know yeah. weren't weren't singles for, for sort of good reason and and the next the the next thing that he decided was all the sounds that we were going to play had to have been taken off the original multi-track tape. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it took about a year of, of production of sort of lifting sounds off, mixing, you know, mixing them, making them sound like they did on the record. But obviously, you know, on tape is the sound of a drum later kick, for instance, but it's not got the EQ that it ended up with on the final master and it's not got any uh, any sort of reverb or processing or whatever so just recreating all, all that and it was great i mean and, and sort of it was a real challenge to be able to do that and and not just not just in terms of the electronics and sort of understanding how to make that all all playable but physically being able to cover stuff that had never been played by a human before so it wow. all, pretty much all been programmed with live hats over the top of it so you, you're sort of playing a playing a 16th hat thing and then there's a clap thing that comes in there and there's a cowbell thing there's this sort of proper four-way coordination <laughs> stuff oh it was great I, I loved it it was it was it was it was a proper challenge but um but yeah i mean i love those sort of things and so i would like, always sort of it's fries my brain to where to even start you know did so does he, if i'm right did he want the sounds that were put on tape but not the master eq'd sounds no, no, no. So, we, so the the sound started that, but what we had access to the multi track from Warner's, um, but the but those multi tracks were were all dry because obviously the the ah, right, they, right. They, they they come back off the tape through the desk in in the mixing process, but that's when reverb and, and EQ would be yeah. put on them rather, yeah. rather than be printed to tape with those. Right. So it was a bit of a it was a bit of a beast, and then yeah, and so we we toured that we toured that album for a good couple of years. Like, went around america three or four times and did some european dates and japan and stuff and then um, and then we did more of a sort of hits hits type um to sort of following that that we did for another what three years or something on and off and um, that was yeah. um yeah it was full on that was that was you know at the time when i was juggling being in kim's band and howard's <sighs> band and boy george's band wow <laughs> which was a bit um it was a bit full on <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's just all kind of yeah. It's just all bonkers. But it's like having the having that ability to just, like you said earlier, solve that problem. Would not have got you a gig. You'd have lost the gig. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I, and and I, 
I, you know, you, you, you sort of talked about Bombay Dreams um, earlier, and I, and I would say that, I mean, that, that was, that's been a bit of a gateway, really, because I, I was really into electronics when I was, when I was much younger. Yeah. Um, um, so I had, a, I had this ridiculous rack of, of gear and an MPC and stuff, in whenever it would have been, 89, something like that. Um, and sort of, there, there was a band that I was in where I was playing a sort of kit and <laughs> keys from a from an octopad because you could you could you could stack three MIDI notes on an octopad so you could make chords and then you could have a sustain pedal where it would hold it down for you know I mean it was completely <laughs> ridiculous and, um, and then I sort of, I stopped doing the electronics thing for for quite a few years actually sort of pretty much all the way through the nineties because I was I was in I was just in bands for a long time sort of through most of the nineties. And then I started getting back into electronics um, in the early 2000s. And Bombay Dreams sort of came up out of that. And it, that was really interesting. And I think I, it, it, not only did it open a lot of, a, a lot of doors for me, but mm -hmm. I think um, it, it, it gave me confidence that I could literally solve any sort of potential issue with, with like, how are we going to do this? Right. Because... Um, what they had was um, multi-tracks, audio multi-tracks, and and I had a Fidge Adams was there to program with me, who's who's amazing, and we had two S six thousand and a Roland TD twenty, and a, the S the S six thousand is just a basic sort of hardware sampler, right? And and we had the multi-tracks in Pro Tools, and it was just a case of going through the multi-tracks and going, well, on this song, what is there? There's a kick snare there's a hat there's um you know this sound and that sound how we okay so that's simple we can we can do that on this track all uh. we've got is is um there was one track called ganesh and the, uh, ganesh is the the big sort of celebration dance that they that they oh. do um sort of um and and it's sort of multiple dolls and dolax and you know okay, instrument yeah. like or you know the the indian equivalent of a sort of uh samba batakuda sort of street drumming thing how am i going to wait that work then <laughs> so so what we ended up doing was creating loops chopping the loops up and then splitting it around the kit so that you would you would play each slice of the loop around the toms and and interspersed with ghost notes and it sounded it, great it worked it worked so well you know and there were other bits where he's playing sitar and stuff like that because wow. there was like a sitar sort of um uh you know there was a sitar a patch uh, sort of a line that was sort of like dang, 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 like a drone type yeah, thing yeah. so i was play, playing that on the snare and then playing sort of percussion <laughs> stuff around the i was great i'm like literally love love the challenge of that and i mean to be fair I'm not entirely convinced my depths love the challenge. I was going to say, whoever picked that think, show up after yeah. you must have just been like, what? Well, I think, I, yeah, I, I mean, there were some great players came and did that. And, uh, but I, I get the impression that it was, um, it was probably more challenging <laughs> than it might have been. Yeah, I bet it became one of those things where like, have you done that yet? You, should, you really should go and give it a go and see. You know what? I've never even thought of that, but actually, you're probably absolutely right, and they're probably absolutely cursing me behind my back. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Do you, have you seen this, this the rig for Broadway's Kinky Boots? You know what? Um, I, 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 well, I saw Andy McGlasson's rig um, right. in, in, in London. Um, yeah, I mean, that that's sort of supposed thing. to be up there as well. Eh? Yeah, I think so. The thing is, though, if you've, if you've, if you've programmed it yourself, and it makes sense to you. That's fine. That's one thing. If you've got to get into the head of somebody else's, you know, they've done the programming. You know, that can be that can be more complicated. Yeah. And um, you know, just just learning the logistics of, of something like that on a on a show. I mean, I, I never I never did Kinky Boots in town, but I, I know that it was it, there, there were things about it that were complicated. But you know, if you're doing it yourself, it's a it's a it's a different thing, I guess. You know? Yeah, it's, it's one of those things because I think. In Broadway, if I'm right, the drummers get paid extra for firing off all the clicks. <clears throat> if only that were were a, were a thing, um, <laughs> yeah. you know. Because so, I mean, I I I run track with almost every artist that I that I work right. with and have done for a long time, and um, I don't know why that is. I'm I'm glad that I do though, because I'd rather be in control of rather be in control of it. So if something you know, 
goes wrong. It, it's just so much easier that if you know when the click is coming, you, you start it, you get the count, rather than it just randomly appearing in your ear. Um, yeah. Well, we, we're so associated with generating the time anyway. You know, the, like drummers generate, everybody keeps time, but drummers generate time. So, yeah, it would make absolute sense for you to have control over that. And I guess in a pit for the drummer to have control over that, but it just like it just makes it kind of bonkers if you if you I mean imagine it's your first gig and you've never seen a rig like that and you're just like what is this and you know how was the was your love for electronics a growth thing or was it just all of a sudden you you know what I mean because the the, the way I'm going to liken this believe it or not is to is to the guys of the 80s that played death metal the the speed that they learned to play at grew with the music it wasn't like everybody could all of a sudden play double bass drums at 2.30. They started at, at 1.60, and, and over a period of however many years, the music gets faster and faster. Was that a, was that a similar thing with the electronics? Well, I think so, and I think, I, think, um, I think that also ties in with the sort of general progression of, of music technology as it did through the 80s, mm-hmm. from, from, from as, as I sort of started getting interested in, in the technology. So I, I, I guess, so I started playing sort of keyboard keyboards in what was I 85 say something like that I started playing drums in 86 and um you know at at, at, at the time when I started playing there were there were what was there DX7 and you know later on the M1 and the D50 and those, those sort of keyboards around mm-hmm. and then there was the sort of high-end stuff like your fair lights and stuff and a few drum machines and that and that sort of exponentially grew towards the end of the 80s and and it was you know so everybody started out simple and, and by the end of the eighties everybody had ridiculous <laughs> ridiculous rigs with sort of you know needing to work out ways of uh, of sort of tying it all together, but I think I think my interest in it was it, it has sort of always been about um, being able to recreate um, the sounds that you heard on a record and just right. sort of trying to work out trying to work out how that how that was done and there you know I I still think that's something that really interests me not just the production side of it but like is what what is it that of about this production you know this this record say take a take a katie perry record as a perfect example what's going on in this record why why do i feel this way about when i listen to it what is making me go to think this is an expensive sounding record you know max martin's <laughs> produced produce this record what makes me and, and when you deconstruct it and when you sort of read interviews with the guys that have been involved in making that record you realize sort of the level of complexity of what's going on with with some of those pop <clears throat> pop tracks and it's like well okay that that's you know steve wolf's played played mm. kit on it but you can you know it's barely audible in the background but it's adding this sort of energy that, that you know if you took it away you'd miss it mm-hmm. and then circuit's done the programming from there's like 10 snare drums on there and they all yeah. they're all doing different things you know there's a different set of snares to the verse and there is from the chorus and in the chorus it gets wider and it gets fatter and it gets bigger and it makes you it lifts everything and those sort of production techniques are great if you can bring that to to a live gig you know mm-hmm. if, if if it's possible you know can you when you're playing along instead of just going to the ride to lift 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 the lift the chorus can you go to the ride and add a backbeat on a clap with the snare as well or you know maybe yeah. it triggers just in the just in the course those sort of things that are production things that are um fun little fun little things to to throw in and you know yeah it's it's uh, g- generates questions off uh, off the answer just get them in my head but how do you how do you then if you i mean if you're not accustomed to it how do you then take that out and translate it live? Like, what do you dis- how do you decide what's important, right? Because you're probably not going to play 10 snare drums live. Without it running in the fills and it becoming too much. So how does one then decide, okay, I'm go- what, what's important here to take away? Yeah, I think, I think you've absolutely hit the nail on the head of, of one of the most important questions that we should all be asking ourselves anytime, mm. anytime we sit behind the drums, or or anytime we choose to make music, which is what's in, what's important, you know, to mm-hmm. focus on the on the sort of the broad brushstrokes of of um, the listener experience, um, and the listen, 
the listener experience might be extremely focused on on you know uh, how is the artist singing is the yeah. artist singing <laughs> you know can yeah. i hear the words that i love to listen to on this song you know i'm thinking about people that come and come and watch a gig that 70 percent I, mean, I literally just made that figure up but let's say it's 70 70 percent of the people come to see a gig are just interested in hearing those songs that they love yeah, done in a way that that makes them happy and and i guess our job is to interpret what that is does it make it you know is there going to be a queue of people asking for their money back if it's not the same snare snare sound as on the record absolutely not but can you create through the through what we do as 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 a drummer which is the building block on upon which all you know all other stuff is built it's the foundation upon which everything else is built can we do something to lift the energy on stage and for me um i would say one of the one of the skills that i think is really important that as i think is one of the reasons why i've been hired to 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 do gigs like this in in the past is about giving a, a sense of security and confidence to the artist mm -hmm. and that might be about in rehearsals it's been clear that i've understood their music and i've bothered to listen to the, their yeah. tunes and and <laughs> you know I've, you know if, it, if it's a track that gad played on perfect example um you know it, when 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 I toured with Odyssey and Gad had played on all those all those records, it's like oh my goodness, I get to play all these Gad tracks. Like, and I just I sat and I learned all the fills, oh, really? every single <laughs> every single one, like properly, you know, all all those sort of beautiful Gad Gadisms and just you know trying to trying to play. And I got a pair of um, the Vic Firth Gad sticks, and I was oh. just like, do you know what? I'm really gonna go all in on this. <laughs> and you know, he has that way of of. You know how he plays the hats, which is like his arm is is sort of there, yeah. and it's, it's forward, and it's sort of from there. And and I loved doing that. Did it make a difference to the gig? Probably not. Did the artist appreciate the fact that I'd put the work in, showing respect to their music? Yeah, probably, and they probably felt more comfortable because of that. And I think, I think that if if we can bring a degree of <clears throat> comfort to the artist, that's the first thing that we should always be doing. Um, you know, which is you know why I would always want to be massively prepared going into any situation as much as possible. Go, be hugely prepared going into in a, into any situation, whether it's a rehearsal or whether it's a you know if it is a session or whatever to to sort of have a have an idea of of, of just a, a level of pre preparation that means i'm not going to be caught out and makes makes people feel comfortable yeah well it's, it's beyond anything you've just given them their place you know like the, this is music that they've put time and energy and heart and soul into and if you dismiss it whether you mean to or not you know whether you you just you you do it by being underprepared it's not really going to stand anyone in good state. I can see why there's longevity in your career if that's how you prepare. If if you're if you're going to that kind of minutiae of of like well, I do overdo it a bit. I, but I you know, I really I I enjoy that. And sometimes sometimes it's I do enjoy it. And 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 it's a challenge and I w I would say it, my so my practice practice um <laughs> now um more than anything else um because I don't really sit and play paradiddles with a metronome mm -hmm. i'm not saying that people shouldn't do that because you absolutely should um at, at, at a certain time but my practice has <clears throat> turned turned into sort of in preparation for gigs trying to really get into the under the skin of the music that, mm -hmm. that i'm playing and i mean one of the i, I know i know you had neil wilkinson on um, mm -hmm. a little while oh, yeah. back and um and 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 I dealt, I dealt for him on Beautiful when it was in the West End. And that oh, was such a, yeah, it was such a great experience. I, I mean, beautiful band. You couldn't, you couldn't book a better band <laughs> in the world <laughs> at that time. It was, they, were, they were so, so great. And it was a lovely situation to go in with, you know, really great tunes and everything about the gig was, was sort of, um, you know, the sound was great and um, the arrangements were really good. But um, the thing that I loved about it most was I got to sit behind Neil and hear him, not through microphones, <laughs> 
yeah, and right. watch him do the, do the show a couple of times. And actually, um, it was great. That was a real sort of a, a turning point for me, um, it, sort of playing wise, because you know I've been up until that point been using pretty big sticks for quite a while right, okay. and playing in a, in a sort of fairly heavy and muscular sort of heavy heavy way you know i wanted the drums to be hit and stay stay hit you know that, that was that was sort of the vibe and then I sat, sat behind sat behind neil and watched him play you know with his beautiful touch that he's got with a pair of 80 jazz sticks and go okay i need to i need to have a look at this so i, I got i got some um big for something some some uh, they're actually like the porcaro stick i think that's what they yeah, call yeah. the um um it'll come to me anyway um it's a signature stick that's the same as the as the regal porcaro stick Keith Callops? they're not actually i've got them right here hang on all oh, right okay this is new for uh, me these are oh tony royster i should have known all oh, right tony okay. Roy- yeah the tony wow, royster okay. stick which is which is um it's basically an eight a eight D, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, with, with a with a yeah with a with a um, with a barrel tip on it, and they're they're really so. Um, I, I learned to sort of play with a light touch, and that sort of hopefully try and um, replicate that that beautiful touch that Neil Neil's got behind the drums, where he manages to make everything sort of um, seem seem prettier, which is it's it's an astonishing feat. Uh, he's, he's, he can he's, he's, just yeah. something else, you know, yeah, something else. Awesome. Um, but um, but yeah, that that sort of I, I, it's not just a uh, don't do it just for the sake of sort of attention to detail. I'll do it so that I don't end up looking stupid on the gig <laughs> as much as anything. Yeah, well, I think we've all been there at, at one point in our life. Um, okay, so I you you soon as you mentioned Neil, I spoke to him about Deppin and especially on West End shows. So I'm going to ask you about that as well because we've established perhaps that you enjoy the prep and being a you know being in control in that seat is really important so how do you feel or how do you deal with it when you don't have that chance you may be doing two two set ends and then you've got to basically not quite sight read it but it's not far away um well my little secret is that i do put the work in <laughs> right even though you don't i right. yeah i i i I wouldn't put myself in a situation where I didn't feel like I could do a, a constant okay. job. That's cool. I, I, there, there have been times when it's not been that. Um, and and to be fair, it, it's been fine. I mean, I, I, you know Alan Dale, don't you? you must yeah, very well. Very um, well. And uh, Alan, um, it must have been a while, it must have been 10 years ago, broke his broke, broke a finger quite 2006. Bad. Was it really? Oh, gosh. Because that's, that's when that's he moved bad. to London and he did it the day he moved down, played five or six. I, I wow, that's astonishing. If it was that long ago, that's yeah. quite frightening. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I I got a call um, from I think Tim Goodyear went in and, and did a couple, and then I got a yeah, call right. saying, "Can can you can you come in and 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 do this?" And it was pretty much a sight read. Um, and actually, you know, it was fine. I mean, it, 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 there, there were there were as with as is often the case with some Western shows, there were some sort of um, things that you need to wrap your head around but um but uh but ge- generally it was it, it was fine and, and it, you know in those sort of situations any show i mean not any show most shows now the charts are pretty well written yeah it, that's not that's not always the case and certainly when i started that wasn't the case at all right. you know you would see charts and and there would be a degree of interpretation um <laughs> that you have to do and and you just have to sort of rewrite something and go okay that's not what he plays I'm going to have to rewrite this and, and just sort of learn it that way. But actually, you know, if you saw most of those charts on a function gig, you'd be fine. Mm-hmm. Actually, it would be fine. The issue is that the expectation of the band and occasionally, you know, the front of house sound team or the dancers or or whatever, the expectation is that it's exactly the same as the person that normally does the show. So that that does require a degree of, non-interpretation you've just got to learn what they do and how they do it so are they are they a little bit lighter on the bass drum than you'd normally play okay well you just need to back up or do they play the hats louder than you would comfortably do it yeah okay so you, because all those things might add up to you know the, the md gets a note from the dance captain saying didn't like the drums right well wow, just, just got 
you know, you just got to protect yourself from from that by being as prepared as you can. But you know, sometimes it's it's not possible to to to, to do that. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it makes me kind of what's the word I want here? Not it makes me uncomfortable because if a dancer was to come in and and be or or, or a third understudy Elphaba is on the stage, she's not going to be the same because she's not the same human. You know, so uh, I, I and and again, uh, getting onto a, uh, a little bit of a high horse about 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 um, shows, and I know I know you, you touched on it with Neil when you spoke to him, but I, I I do it does feel as if um, from when I started doing shows in the West End, and my first show that I did was definitely for Ralph Salmons right. on a show that had <laughs> the absolute, I mean, just the best musicians that you could possibly put yeah. in a room together were on that. It was Steve Pierce, Pete Adams, Frizzy Carson, and Ralph. That is a rhythm rhythm section. You know, they used to call them God's rhythm section. That was <laughs> the the London rhythm section, and and that was great. But actually, the, they were not often there, and that created because they were busy. Right. You know, Ralph's Ralph's off doing you know Van Morrison or whatever. It's great for me. I used to get in there all the time, but it, I think it used to create tension there. And I think what's happened sort of more recently is that. Um, is that I think West End shows would generally rather have someone who is available rather than someone who's a star player. Yeah, is, right. Is, is, uh, you know, and it's possible, it is possible to be both. I mean, there are, there are people who do, do shows in the West End who are genuine, you know, star players. Um, but, um, but, you know, I, I, that, that and the sort of juggling doing eight shows a week thing and the sort of effect that it can have on your on your mental health or <laughs> maybe maybe i should be more specific the effect that it certainly had on my mental health um uh, uh made, made it more of a more of a challenge than, uh, than 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 it perhaps might have been but um but yeah yeah it's uh, yeah it's, it's it's i just there's things like I, some of the shows i've been doing and whilst they're not at a pro level that it's things like we've got the conductor waving us along and the, the, the ensemble or the cast are just clean out an entrance. They'll chop like two or three bars off someone and they, they come in, or they, they, they make their cue early. So all of a sudden you're reading a rest and you're all of a sudden instead of the, the like you're in bar six instead of bar three. And like shit, if you don't have ears on you or you don't have, you know, the wherewithal to catch up, it can be disastrous for people, you know, but you're not treated the same way as they are, you know, it's a strange thing. I I I would su suggest though that 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 sort of um, <clears throat> that degree of bailing people out <laughs> is, is sort is sort of the gig. Yeah. Um, okay. um, I, I would say that partly because there's quite a lot of shows that I've done where the person conducting <laughs> hasn't been great. I mean, mm. I, I, it, it's fortunately it's not it's not often the case but there have been shows where where conductors have been pretty poor you know mm. they've 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 sort of evolved to being a conductor because they were the second keyboard player and then the second keyboard player magically becomes the conductor on another show because that's sort of just what happens yeah because mds have to be keyboard players because you have to do a warm-up with a piano therefore yeah. <laughs> even if you've not got a particularly great time you can stand in front of an, an orchestra, which is so that can be fine if there's stuff on click that can be absolutely fine, and, and you know all the all the potential sort of um, variables can be taken away, and it's fine. Mm -hmm. But I have been in situations where it's been like three, four, one, two, three, four, oh, you know, I, and it's just like, whoa, my goodness, yeah. and then you're in a situation where you have to make judgments about about how do you um, how do you how do you handle that situation? I mean, it's it's one thing if it's your gig, but if you're depping that's um that's that's really quite complex uh, a sort of political situation to um to negotiate and i mean my top tip for that is to smile at the md and play what you think is right yeah. <laughs> and just and just you know hope hope for the best really but um but yeah no it's a tricky thing and but like i say that that mindset of of sort of um sort of the role of of the role of, the, of being a drummer or the role that I see of, of, as being a drummer, which is not just being a drummer, but sort of being a facilitator for the whole energy of what is going on at that particular moment, whether it's on stage or whether it's, you know, whether in the studio. Um, that 
as a as a facilitator you're also there to fix issues and mm -hmm. that you know you know some things can't be fixed if you're on a on a session with somebody who gets extremely nervous when the red light goes on and they're playing something that's going to be loud in the mix then that's a hard thing to fix yeah, but right. you know you, you can do your bit to to try and make that make that work man yeah it's funny this this playing music business it can be I mean, like playing music is the, the the least of it at times. It it really is, and I, you know, and I think those 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 skills, you know, that sort of breadth of of skills. I'm not talking about myself here. I'm talking about sort of anybody who who um, you know makes a living um, being a being a musician in any in any form, whether you're a keyboard player or you know whatever instr mm -hmm. instrumentalist or or or, or, or whatever you're going to have another set of skills that are over and above just playing your instrument. And, you know, what, what are those skills? Do you, do you bring a level of energy to the room that, um, that makes people feel comfortable? Do you bring a sort of a sense of humor into the room? Do you, mm. do you bring it, you know, um, all, all those sort of extra skills that, 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 that people have that they can bring, you know, do you bring in an amazing sort of musical knowledge and understanding like, like, you know, I'm fortunate enough to do do sort of sessions with piano players. We think, blimey, that's a, yeah. that's astonishing what you've done there. You, you've in, you've interpreted a sort of really quite quite boring state. Something you've made something genuinely beautiful out of that in the moment. And that's and that's just, uh, yeah, it's a, an astonishing skill. I would about fifteen years ago, we had Mark Showman in clinic. Oh wow, yeah, and he was in the throes of still doing Pink's gig, and he told a story about everybody on Pink's gig doesn't matter who you are, whatever your job was, you had an alternative job. So Mark's job was to play the drums and to go and get everybody's coffee. Yeah. So he was like, right, team, you know, light and tech, whoever it is, dancing, whoever, what's your coffee order? And he would go to Starbucks and get coffee for the whole crew and bring it back. And that was his secondary job. And every single person on that tour had one of those jobs because it knitted them as a family because it stopped being about us and them you know because front of house and back of house can be us and them you know who was i listening to recently was talking about back of house i was like why is it even called back of house like it's not do you know what i mean like that i can't remember what podcast i was listening to but it was someone talking about the difference between front of house and back of house and how it shouldn't even be called the back of the house because what is the back of the house in your house you know yeah i mean exactly and you know you're all part of a part of a team and i think it's so important to to sort of um, be aware of how much you know not only your tech looking after you as the drummer but mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um the guy that the guy that loads the gear onto the, onto the truck you know <laughs> or it, 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 there, these are all important cogs in in the machine on a, on a tour you know yeah. on, a, on a big tour um that that everybody relies on every, everybody else and it's important to remember that that it doesn't function you know if any one of those cogs stops functioning properly for whatever reason then everything stops functioning properly and, Amen. Um, um so we're going to switch gears and talk about gear um, because <laughs> we're a drum store, and you like all sorts of gear. Um, I do, I do. I have, a, I uh, yeah. Uh, my name's Jonathan, and I do have an addiction to, <laughs> to, to, to hi, particularly Jonathan, to, particularly to snare drums, um, particularly to snare drums. Um, but um, but yeah, no, I do a bit. And, so uh, I, I I love them. I was I'd listened to your podcast with Simon, and you talked about um, things like gear on stage and what you like and what you don't like and that kind of thing but are, the first thing we're going to start with is are you a vintage gear guy or a modern gear guy i it depends on the gig and okay. it depends it depends why vintage right so so i i have a i have a setup for stage um or a, a, a few choices of setup for stage that are purely about um the things that i need from a mm. drum kit on stage and that would be borne out by so i would say live i probably get to play my own kit about 30 percent of the time and the rest of the time it's a rental what is your we're, kit? Fly, we're flying, flying so the current one that i'm using with kim wild i've got a 1970 uh gretch stop sign uh it is stop sign 
interestingly, they are round bad shells. <laughs> Oh well, wow, it's, okay. tr- it's a track which I didn't know when I bought it, um, but Richard Newby very kindly um, mm. re- uh, refinished it for me um, and uh, made it a little bit more usable and replaced the spurs, which are obviously utterly unusable <laughs> on a 1970s Gretsch kit, um, and um, and it sort of made it made it a little bit more um, uh, stage friendly. So, uh, right. And so so that is it's it's uh, it's a whatever it is. 50 something year old kit wow. uh but it but it yeah. behaves like a brand new one which is great um but before so the re, the reason for that, that actually that was just a, that was just because kim wanted everything on stage to be either black or red so i just got okay. the kit finished refinished in black uh before then live i'd been using a dw um just a collectors which is great and i i literally i bought that kit in like 2009 or something because i was a little bit unsure about my lovely 1980 which you can probably see see behind me the blue one blue, yeah. um um uh, I, I was a little bit unsure about that getting chucked in the back of a truck all the time <laughs> um and i i, I do I, I love that kit and i sort of i got the dw because i knew that if something broke on it or somebody drove over something you know drove over the yeah. bass drum with a truck or something you know that that i could get replacement bits for it um but um the, for me on stage the the most important thing is that stuff stays where it's put and stays yeah. in tune and so my my rider for higher gear is either a yamaha kit or a dw kit yeah. because in my experience those are the drums that um even from a rental company that hasn't looked after the stuff if you stick new heads on it even if it's like a i'm not had like a nine thousand kit from like 30 years ago with new heads on it and it's absolutely fine and everything still works on it yeah. whereas there have been some other companies where that's not not the case you know how hardware starts wearing and you know toms start dropping or <laughs> you know yeah. bass drums start moving away from you all those sort of things so, i mean dw and yamaha, yamaha from my point of view is that and, and i know that i can get that anywhere in the world from any any sort of rental rental place do you know so. dave stewart uh i don't He's he's out on the European tour of cats. He he's done a lot of theatre work. He used to play for De- uh, Deacon Blue and stuff. He played for Albert Hammond Junior recently. Oh, okay, cool. Dave was doing that gig on a stage custom. Wow, okay, because they just work, man. They they just work, and you, I mean, you know, you could say the same about about a lot a lot of companies, I guess, with you know, with the with their um, sort of lower end kits, I think. But um, but you know, I, I, the the new stage customs look amazing. I was actually really tempted with those the little the dinky version of that yeah, one that yeah, Richard right. Spaven's playing the little yeah. with the dinky dinky bass drum. That I think that's cool. That's a different sort of thing. But, you know, they put they put hardware on it that is equivalent to what they were putting on their top line kits ten years ago. Yeah, and it, that's that's amazing. That is a whole lot different from you know the the sort of lower end kits of of twenty thirty years ago, which were which would which would have problems you know i mean not yeah. not all of them i mean you know I, I i one of the first kits i ever had was a premiere projector whenever that would have been 86 or something mm-hmm. and um a friend of mine bought it off me and, and uh, from what i understand it's still going strong and still <laughs> you know still still behaving because those were brilliantly made kits but i think there were there were other kits that were made around that sort of time that probably probably are struggling now I don't yeah I, I think so we see them come and go you know people trying to trade in kits from days of yore because they're they're attached to it and of course they are it's an instrument and and instruments have emotional attachment but yeah they they can be hanging together and you're like this is not sellable you know? absolutely i talking about stage customers i literally just bought um you might be able to sit in the background one of the um stage custom steel shell um snares oh like yeah seven, 70 quid or something i i got given one as a as a um on a on a rental kit as just like a spare just to have there i was like oh, i just know let's try it out and it sounded great, yeah. and they stay in tune. Yeah, and it's like that's a really good drum. For yeah, whatever, whatever they whatever they go for, you know, hundred and thirty quid new, I think. Uh, is that is that what it? Yeah, yeah, I think I think I paid seventy five or something on mm. eBay. But you know, even at one hundred and thirty quid, that is a that is a bargain. Well, top, I mean, top the, tip. <laughs> yeah, the last five to ten years have seen a sort of massive renaissance with Yamaha. Every product that they've brought out sort of climbs to the top of its product its product tree. So they the, they make the best pedal going at the moment. Their electronics are are the top of the, the sort of mass are produced 
electronics. Um, like EADs, remarkable piece of kit. You know, can you imagine that twenty years ago? Just like it's funny because we're it's, it's like going back to how they recorded drums in the fifties, just stereo microphones, man, and and just yeah, and and kind of doing it all with your playing. It's this kind of you know that they, but the the gear they can they can put out now is just ridiculous. Have you seen the Crosstown hardware yet? No, nah, that's the uh, that's the ultralight aluminium yeah. stuff, isn't it? The, the I have seen it. it. I've not. Yeah, I've not used it. I, ha- I have seen it. Uh, that that does interest me actually. Um, well, the entire set yeah. weighs seven kilos. It's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> so, um, the my my studio kits uh, get looked after by Simon Jay's at London Drum Company, and. Um, all my heavy hardware has ended up sort of <laughs> mi- migrating over to there just because I don't want to be lifting it. Yeah. But I know that he absolutely curses me. Um, yeah. And I'm pretty sure that probably one of the old school Yamaha heavyweight boom stands probably weighs more than 70 kilos. <laughs> yeah. The old peril ones are the sonar ones with the massive ball on the end of them to counterweight them and all that, you know, from the 80s. Um, so there's your vintage versus um, modern extent to electronics as well. I'm afraid it does. I don't, I, you said something really telling to Simon about how modern electronics are basically not stage ready. Things like outputs. So I, that is a source of extreme frustration for me. <laughs> and, and um, I, I tell you why that, that, that is the case. And I obviously need to be a little bit careful um, about exactly what I said. I can't, that's interesting that you heard that, heard that podcast actually. When, when was that? That must've been about six, seven years ago. Yeah. That? Something like that. Something like that. 20, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, whilst you're talking, I'll find a date. Yeah. So the, the thing of electronic drums, not having more than a stereo output pair is just nuts. Mm. And that is, that hasn't been resolved by quite a few companies yet and here's the reason why and i have spoken to a lot of people about this and i am aware that there are reasons why that's not on people's radar but from my point of view if i do a gig where i'm running electronic kick and snare and you do one you know say as simple as that so on my on my rig with kim i've got a kt10 Mm -hmm. um uh, for maybe a third of the set, I play the kick drum on that, uh, just playing uh, samples. And then I might there are, there are a few tracks where I play snare um, on the multi twelve, um, so that might be like an eight hundred eight type thing, like a clap or you know whatever whatever's needed to 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 have the flavour of the song. Um, if if you do a gig at a festival where there might be thirty thousand people there and the subs are immense and they go down to 15 hertz yeah which is perfectly possible you are going to hear something totally different out of the kick drum than if you know than from a little club where the subs might roll off at say 40 hertz because it's a small you know concrete room (laughs) and if your front of house engineer does not have control over either the level or the the eq of your kick drum channel you, you can, that's a non-starter and we've done you know and you can't get go in and individually eq each each sample that's not how it works no. it's going to behave differently in the different settings depending on how the pa is set up depending on how how much low end you get out of it it needs to be on a separate fader for front of house and you can't do that if you've only got two out well you can because what i do is i just send all my kicks out of one hole and all my snares out of the other but that yeah. that means that everything has to be mono yeah so which is it's sort of fine I, it doesn't massively bother me it just frustrates me that it's not dealt with because you know I, i'm sure there are people who you know if you're just doing a pub gig and all you do is pub gigs absolutely fine and there's nothing wrong with that, that at all but for pro players mm-hmm. you've got to have you've got to have individual control of low end and high end separately on their okay. own Roland are trying, I think, now the new SPDSX Pro has more outputs on it. Yeah, it, that does look good. And, I, you know, and, and you know, and this is not to criticise Yamaha for it at all, because I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're working on, on something, um, you know, new, because it's been a while since, since they had, um, since the Multi-12. I would say that the Multi-12 wins hands down in terms of um, uh, how solid they are. 
And, I, I've got um, both. I've got an SPDS X and a Multi Twelve, and right. even things like the quality of the samples in it. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I I, I it's all my own samples I've got in it, which is right. a, it's a little bit of a faff. But once you're done and you're on a you're on a gig, they they are rock solid. They're great, and yeah. I I would you know hundred hundred percent. And I still think you know the DTX nine hundred kit, uh, which I know has been superseded by the by the new one, but I've not not had a chance. I'm, I'm getting a chance to play one of those hopefully next week. But um, but yeah, I, they they're great. They they are really good. I still use my D drum four from nineteen ninety five quite a lot, and um, and that's the, the the MIDI implementation on it it, it. it it is brilliant. You could play. You know, I I did. Um, I did some stuff for um, that TV series Outlander, where oh, they right, wanted okay. yeah. um, some sort of big, big drum stuff, you know, Tycho and all that sort of stuff, and a bit of, you know, well, I mean, also it was all sorts of stuff, but they there was only room for one player, and it needed to be samples, and so I had, had to do that. And and the D drum is great for that, for doing, for being able to go from really delicate sort of um, super quiet stuff, super loud stuff. It feels very natural to play that. And, um, so what what's the difference in that than than in modern engines? How does it what what did they do differently? Do you know? I don't I don't know the answer to that. It's something about how because um, it's not about the pad. It's mm-hmm. about it's about how the brain interprets that information. Right. And it just seems it just seems to work. Yeah. They they are they just are really 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 good in that respect. So that they, that's why I hanging on to a I'm hanging on to a thirty year old piece of electronics. <laughs> and um hoping to God you can find a repair man should you need one. Oh well yeah no, absolutely <laughs> <laughs> what um there was something else that left me kind of astonished when you'd spoken to Simon was was that you you managed to send Bob Clearmount some tracks and he didn't know it was samples which is Yeah I, I didn't actually send yeah no that that was on an album that I did but um yeah yeah it's uh, that was using superior and um and d drum and superior and that, um, that yeah. whole world is immense now what yeah and it's it's so much beyond where it was even yeah. 10 years ago um yeah no absolutely and i you know I've, I've been fortunate enough to be sort of doing some sampling for some of those some of those uh companies and have have been sort of in the process of setting up my own thing as well to, oh, to do something do something similar but, um, oh, but yeah no, you're absolutely right yeah Great. it's um it's you know <laughs> Because you know people should have access to decent drum sounds, I think. And, yeah, yeah, I think so. And, and and you know when you can put out the level of electronics that you're putting out for not much money, I don't think it's too much to ask now, at all. Absolutely, and uh, you know I, I I do think I do think Yamaha have done a great job with the sounds that they've they've put in the new um, machines. Not that I haven't like I say I haven't played them yet, but what what I've heard they are great. Yeah. Um, I just did did some uh, I did a sound library for Korg. Um, which I, I don't actually know where they ended up. Somebody said to me they ended up in the new mimic, but I don't actually know if that's true oh, okay. yet. But um, but yeah, and um, and a company called Nectar, who are German, a German hardware company who make uh, make this in fact, which is like a it's like their equivalent of uh, Native Instruments machine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, which is really good. That's, I my own, I, I think that's actually the best thing on the market. Actually, it's called the um, Nectar Aura. And it's got the best feeling pads of uh, of all the ones, and I have I have used all of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's really good. So, so I've, just, I've just done a done a library for them. Why would one use something like that as opposed to electronic drums? What what are you going to get? Um, I so I quite often do something where where I might be programming something like if it's a pop track, I might be uh, programming something that might be sort of fully electronic sounds mm-hmm. in which case i sort of i'm sort of in this in between the I, mean, I i'm 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 aware that i'm going to get go down this little rabbit hole now That's so i won't right. go too deep down go too deep down the rabbit hole but there are ways of creating the sort of drums that you hear on on you know, like max martin productions for instance that's a perfect example would be a Mac, uh, um, you know the way that max builds his his stuff there'll be you know, Wolf and, and Circuit or whatever would be doing doing their thing by building up layers of um, uh, of drums, which are mostly electronic samples. So they're probably not played in. They're probably individual samples that they've just dragged into the timeline. Right. Um, and that's sort of how I would build that sort of thing now. So I would make the sounds from uh, one of the drum synths that I've got, probably, and I might find some samples and I might layer stuff together. Um, but then sometimes it is quite nice to just play stuff in with a pad 
uh, as as in like a like a you know an NPC type type one of them yeah, yeah, yeah. or um or on my my tempest which I, I use I use a lot um which is like a it's like a cross between a drum machine and a synth mm-hmm. um and that and and just sort of just create some new sounds that nobody's ever heard before and layer you know maybe play a part in the you know the the layer, layers with that and I would do that on pads rather than uh, as in NPC pads rather than play that in because I'm probably only going to play a two and a four right. or, you know, and then, and, and then I'm going to loop it or I'm going to, you know, copy and paste stuff because that's yeah. how it's done. But then I, I would generally go back and, and put something human over the top of it. I, I would either fully track a full kit or maybe just put hats on it or maybe, you know, the, whatever. There was a um, track that Kim did with a single she had with Boy George last year actually in, in, in it was in, in lockdown where I sort of I played a full kit part and then I went back and I tracked like a, a I did a brushes kit thing where it's like a um uh snare playing sort of swishy swishy brushes and I've got a 24 by what would 24 by 10 sort of um marching bass drum from the 20s which has got oh, calf wow. heads on it and um and and do a bit of sort of you know swishy brush so and and that's a that's a, a just an interesting layer that works really nicely in the verse um and then it goes to full kit in the, in the chorus so cool just just you know just ideas just trying to think yeah, of right. fun I- ideas and, and be creative with <clears throat> these sort of multitude of options that we've got for for, for you know for being creative because we can now you know because you know 30 years ago couldn't afford to have a studio set up at home and now right. i've you know i i can record a full full kit in here and, and it'll sound like it well it'll sound like it was recorded in abbey road because yeah I know what I'm doing. <laughs> it's, it's even things like like a mate of mine who i'm doing a wedding gig for him this weekend i'm depping in and he's like oh it's, they want a really obscure first dance and it's an amazing nine inch nails track they want and they're like can you do a recording ahead of time i'm like yeah it'll take me like two minutes to plug my computer into my DTX, knock out a take or two, and he's got it. Like, I don't have to find microphones. I don't have to... I don't even go in... I just use... Have, have you got the new Easy Drummer 3? I, do you know what? I haven't, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm still on two with uh, Superior stuff, um, partly because I've started just making my own sounds. Mm-hmm. So I've got this ridiculous mic set up and all the preamps and all that sort of stuff. And I do really enjoy doing that, but for ease of use, I still get out superior to like yeah. if I've got to do something really super quick. Yeah, it's great. It's, a, it's amazing. And then the new the, the the easy drummer lines all pre mixed. Yes. So you don't. It's not even the dry sounds. It's mixed. So you just literally fart a track out and send it to him. It's like yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? To, to do that would have been a week. Like even five, six, seven years ago, it would have been a week in a studio to get it sounding to the you know so. Anyway, yeah, so no, it's 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 very it's very doable now. I mean, you know, like, if you're going to spend a bit of money on on mics and and and, and stuff, which which I have because you know I I am in here all the time and and I write, you know, I produce a lot of music, so I, I sort of have a pretty fully functioning setup here. Mm-hmm. But um, but you know, you could you could do some pretty great sounding drum tracks with a couple of mics and and you know get get some good sounds. Absolutely. So what's next for you, man? Well. <laughs> um i'm out with kim again um on saturday right. um for the german leg of her um greatest hits tour and then we're sort of we're in and out basically for the, for the whole rest of the year um so sort of kind of two three weeks on and a week or so off and then just through till mid-december um right. which is good um i got a bunch of albums on the go here which is good um you know just loads and loads of writing and 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 drum stuff here a lot of sample creation stuff going on a lot of loops uh, loops happening and all so, that so, uh, I, was, I was talking to simon it, 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 i know you're on the socials a little bit but it's so refreshing to see someone who's working without all of that nonsense without having to be like check out what i'm doing every here's my dinner here's the sticks you know what i mean you're just going to work I mean, I sort of, I sort of I, it, it's partly that I don't really feel like I've got time to time to um, get stuck into that. Um, but also, I slightly, I bore myself 
I start writing something. And I go, uh, that, is so, <laughs> that is so boring. Why are you writing that? But yeah, I mean, to be fair, I, so I did, I, I had a little chat with uh, Sabian very kindly um, sorted out a couple of symbols that were broken. Um, mm -hmm. um, so uh, replaced, replaced some out. And I was speaking to Christian at Sabian uh, a couple of weeks back and he was kind of pointing out that uh, they probably could do with me doing a little bit more <laughs> um because, you know and that, that you know and, and and i totally get that because to be fair they do look after me therefore i should i should thank them for that um on instagram or whatever and 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 you know show people that i am using their symbols which i love and um that's i i choose to use stavian symbols because mm -hmm. they you know they're great and they look after me really well. So yeah. um, there's my little, there's my little, little plug for Savior. <laughs> but no, I, I should, I should be a little bit better about about doing that sort of stuff. But um, but yeah, the sort of um, the the relentless um, um, Instagramming and stuff, I'm I'm not particularly good at. But I, there, I mean, there are people who are amazing at it and and have done really well out of it. In 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 that sort of field of being very good at Instagramming, um, which is a different thing, I think, from from from. Um, being really good at playing the drums, but that's, yeah, that's enough. Yeah, <laughs> I, I see so much of it, guys selling technique stuff, and it's like your technique's not great. Like, yeah, oh, yeah like, uh, I, well, I feel just a bit uncomfortable with all of that, you know. Yeah, and it's well because you have to show off technique uh, for it to it to make sense to be putting something on Instagram. I mean, you know, I'm, I would love it. I would I would totally love it if Steve Jordan had an Instagram <laughs> channel that was just like. Um, yeah, here's me just playing um, for for ninety seconds. Um, I mean, George, I mean, George, uh, he's an absolute favourite of mine. And every time I've, if I do something where it's um, uh, people are going, oh, you know, it's got to be this or it's got to be that, and and like, oh, it's like you know, it feels uncomfortable for whatever reason. I'll get home, and there's a there's footage of him demoing the Yamaha Club Custom, I think it is the orange one, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he just goes. <laughs> with like one fill in the middle for like yeah. five minutes or whatever that's just like oh that just makes me happy you know I love that. reset button yeah exactly that exactly amazing. amazing well man i really appreciate that's over an hour man i really appreciate you've taken time out and and chatted to us um uh it's been really great and really insightful you know it's, it's just nice to see someone balance and so many different facets of a career and so successfully you know because so many people get drawn into one another, so it's nice to see someone doing kind of all of it. Yeah, I mean, it just it, it interests me, and, yeah. and I find it fun fun to sort of be be involved in all that. So yeah, it sort of it's it really suits me. Um, it's that Tony Williams thing of like a drummer should be someone that on Monday can play the Ritz and Tuesday can play with Metallica and Wednesday can play a Brushies gig and on. Do you know what I mean? Like, and and it's uh, that's kind of it's kind of getting lost now. I think you know. And can I just say how much I would have loved to have seen Tony Williams playing with Metallica? Yeah, I mean, he would have probably done a better job. <laughs> that would be amazing. But you know, it, no, that's absolutely true. And you know, and and and, and it's when you when you do see those 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 players who are great at being like proper all around it, like Neil's one of those, Ralph, Yanto, Mike Smith, those those guys that are just you know next level, um, all all rounders with the you know. Being able to have a beautiful touch, playing a playing a, a jazz thing or a big man thing or whatever, and then and then really slamming on a on a groove thing that that makes me so happy that you know that there are players like that in in this country that that maybe don't get the recognition that they they deserve. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, man, it'll come round in if it has to. They're all working. They're all doing their exactly. Thing, yeah, you know, exactly paying that. their paying their mortgage, playing drums. What more can anybody want? Exactly. You know. Well, absolutely. Too right. So, uh, if you're ever in Glasgow. Please feel free to come I, and say hello. I would love to. Yeah, that would be great. Come and I, check I out the store, that. and if there's uh, if there's anything else, you um, you know, if we can, we'll get this shared. And, and if there's anything you want us to share of yours coming up, just let us know. Fabulous, great stuff. Well, thank great you. Great stuff, all man. Day. Cool. Well, love enjoy you Saturday's you. gig. You too, and I'll catch up with you soon. Take care, mate. Cheers. You too. Cheers. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Drummers Only Podcast. Please leave us a review and make sure you subscribe. If you need any more information about us or any gear mentioned, head on over to drummersonly.co.uk and make sure you follow us on all of our social channels at drummersonlyuk. Thanks for listening. Peace.